Now, uh, we're on that, that fourth chapter of uh, Jacob. He rings the gong in those 13th and 14th verses there. This is absolutely basic, what he's talking about here. Notice, 13th is one philosophy of life, the other is the other philosophy of life. And they're beautifully brought into contrast in the opening lines of Faust. I should go to the row. Would somebody tell us who Faust was? He simply spooked the whole mentality of the Western world all in the 16th century. Some say he invented printing. He was the great magician of the 16th century, the most learned man of his time and so forth. Dr. Faust, and of course, he's the subject of the greatest play ever written in, in German, with Goethe's Faust. But here's what we have. He, he contrasts the two lines here. Notice in the 13th verse, Jacob says, you lunkheads, he's trying to get through to them. He says, can't you see what I'm talking about is real, he says. Note the words that are used. The spirit speaketh truth. It speaketh things as they really are, if they're true, and things as they really will be. He keeps repeating that. And they're plain. He's plainly manifest to us. There's no idea reason why you should fight them, he says. We're not the only witnesses. He says the prophets are too. And then the next verse, he says, but the Jews wouldn't settle for that. They were too smart. They didn't want it that way. They didn't want plainness as far as that goes. He says they're uh, uh, looking beyond the mark. And they have to be smart, they have to be intellectual, they have to be, uh, well, it can't be as simple as all that, is the trouble. So that's the way Faust puts it. And the opening lines of the play, the opening line of the play is to have auch Philosophie, Juristerei, Medizin, Durchlang, Studiert mit Heisen bei Now, I've studied everything, he says. And he goes on and says, Heisen Magister, Heisen Galaturger, I'm the most famous man of my time. I know everything, I've studied everything, I've got to the depths of all the sciences and everything. And then here I am, poor old fool, and don't know any more than I ever knew before. So he decides, this thing was in Drum Habish Mr. Magi, I gave him. So I get, committed myself to magic. I'm going to take up magic studies tonight. My obnicht durch Geisteskraft und Kuhn und Boot. Whether I can't through the power of the Spirit and revelation, Geisteskraft through the power of the Geist and revelation, nicht manche. That I might know the meaning of many, of many uh, things, many secrets, he says. That I don't need to say with sour sweat things, a lot of things that I don't know. Boot my students all the time, he says. Does this afar of us develop an innocence of that I might know what, the work, what really holds the universe together? And that question we still don't know. We still don't know the, what, what the power is that holds the universe together. Gravitation is a complete mystery today, as it ever was. So he finally decides to commit suicide, you see, and what stops him is Satan comes in and says, I'll give you what you want. So he makes a pact with Satan, and, uh, and the play goes on. But that takes us to Pearl of Great Price. We're not doing that. But notice, this is absolutely basic here. Here are these people that want a, f a final, here are two final solutions, you see. Uh, they won't settle for this, the spiritual. And he says, that's the way things really are. Well, how are we going to know it? But if you start looking in the other direction, you look forever, because all scientific tests are, are tentative anyway. And because they desire, that's the way they wanted it, he said. And of course they stumble. They'll always stumble on these things. But now he, he, says, I, he says, all right. He says, how do you think these crazy people will ever become the headstone of the corner? How's the God ever going to build on them? He says, well, surprise, surprise, I'm going to tell you. He says in the 18th verse, I will unfold this mystery unto you not by any means get shaken in my firmness of spirit because I get carried away by these things. And he, he gets carried away in the, in the olive tree story here. So uh, this being on the olive, we can save some trouble. I say it goes on for 77 verses. And uh, uh, this is 222, where we have uh, the olive culture, 269. There are two different editions of this. And so uh, in fact, there are three or four. Uh, yeah, here's olive culture. Now, uh, Joseph Smith was a farmer, but he didn't have an olive farm. It was believed in his day and believed in my day, too, that olives would not grow out of sight of the Mediterranean. They had to grow on the Mediterranean shores, the olive wood. And olive culture is a very specialized thing, and it's described here in full detail, I mean, how, to, how to take care of olive trees and the, the peculiar nature of the olive tree, as the man says here. Uh, now, of course, in the Book of Mormon, there's no sign of olive cultivation in the New World, of course. The olive tree is taken from Zenos. He's taken it from the prophet Zenos, who lived way back between Moses and Elijah. He was an old prophet whose works were lost, but in 19, around 1906 there, uh, they were discovered, uh, the works of Zenos, in the uh, pseudophyto. 
So here we go. This olive culture, first of all, should be mentioned because this is as good as, uh, as an indication of reliability of, uh, of the Book of Mormon. Nobody knew much about that then. Now, Zenos' treatise on ancient olive culture, Jacob 5 and 6, is accurate in every detail. Olive trees do have to be pruned and cultivated diligently. See, the miracle of the olive tree is it can't be killed. There are olive trees 3,000 years old. The olive trees, the original olive trees still in the, uh, I suppose, well, whether that was the Garden of Gethsemane or not, the olive trees are, are still there in Athens. You see, you can, cut down, you can cut down an olive till nothing is left and the shoots will start coming up persistently. And of course, it's the source of life for the Mediterranean people. It's, it's your oil. Everything is fried and cooked in olive oil. It's nourishing in its own right. But it's, they don't have soap. Soap was invented by the Saxons, so they always rubbed all the oil all of themselves and then scraped it off. That's the way to clean your, clean your pores and so forth was olive oil. They used it for everything. It was, and remember, our friend Solon, a contemporary of Lehi, was in the olive business. And so, uh, the olive oil business, and it's a great thing. That's why it is the symbol, of course, of, uh, of the Greeks of, of Athens. It's immortal. It springs up forever and so forth. They have to be pruned and cultivated diligently. You can't prune. Uh, I grew up my later years in amid hundreds of acres of olives, and our house was right in the middle of an olive grove. And, so, uh, and, they, were, and they were harvested, and uh, they made very high quality olives, but they had to be treated like this. Olive trees do have to be pruned and cultivated diligently. The top branches, indeed, as, as uh, Jacob tells us, are the first to wither. The new shoots do come right out of the trunk. The olive is indeed the most plastic of trees, surpassing even the willow in its power to survive the most drastic whacking and burning. See, after the city had been destroyed, the one thing that would survive would be the olive trees, and then they could start life again as long as the olive was there. Yes? It speaks of the Lord of the vineyard, and if, if olives are, are trees... Ha, ha. A very good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Strange you should ask. I'm going to tell you pretty soon, yes. Uh, the olive is indeed the most plastic of trees, surpassing even the willow in its power to survive the most drastic whacking sin. A good olive tree is greatly cherished. Notice he cherishes, he weeps about olive trees and everything, which is like a pet. And uh, because a quality of one olive tree isn't the same as another. And when you've got a good one, you stick to it. And you do anything to keep it from, from dying out and deteriorating and withering and so forth. No end of pains are taken to preserve it, even through many centuries. For really superior fruit is very rare and difficult to obtain and perpetuate. The ancient way of strengthening the old trees, especially in Greece, was to graft in the shoots of the oleaster, which was the wild olive. We have all over the valley here, you notice, the one tree that grows everywhere is the Russian olive. You know, these grayish trees, uh, they brought them in for shade, but they just go wild everywhere. They don't bear olives, because they call them Russian olives. Their leaves are just, it belongs to the family of the olives, and their leaves are just like olives. But they grow wild and uh, too wild, as a matter of fact. But you have to graft, uh, graft in the shoots of the oleaster, the wild olive. Also, shoots from valuable old trees are transplanted. Another thing, you see, you not only will not only grow up just like that if you whack it off, but also it's the easiest tree to graft in the world. You just have to stick a branch into it, and it's growing. It's an amazing tree, you know. Uh, too much grafting produces a nondescript and cluttered yield of fruit, as we find in Jacob's story. The top branches, if allowed to grow up, is in Spain and France, where they use them, plant them along the roads and use them for shade, among other things. While producing a good shade tree, they form that way, will indeed sap the strength of the tree and give a poor crop. They don't want it for that. And fertilizing with dung is very important. He uses that word numbers of times here, uh, we'll put, and dung the tree and so on. That's very important, in spite of the preference for rocky ground. You know, it's to the great master's great surprise and the poorest ground, it uh, grows very well and has been practiced in ancient times. <laughs> the thing to be most guarded against, is, of course, is the bitterness of the fruit. That's why you soak it in salt and brine for so long. All these points taken from a treatise on ancient olive culture are duly, though quite casually, noted in Zenos's parable of the olive tree. So here we have a real olive tree going on here, and uh, he talks about it, and as you say, what about this? Uh, well, you see, the nature of the olive tree is it's best to compare with Israel. You can cut it, you can spread it, you can scatter it, uh, you can try to destroy it. Uh, other parts where it became uh, inferior, then it's, all of a sudden it improved later on. Another part that was very superior suddenly and surprisingly uh, starts giving bitter fruit. And this will happen. It'll fool you an awful lot. Uh, so this is uh, sort of a complex ethnical figure in the New World, and this is Abraham's seed, as we say, among all the inhabitants of the earth. It's bit mixed in all together. And so he goes on. And Zeno spake of the house of Israel. Hearken, O ye house of Israel, and so forth. The tame olive tree and the man took the... So we go down the list here, and he pruned it. You can list the number of operations that take place. There are quite a number. There's not as much duplication as you think. 
And again, you think of the laborious, boring style here. Remember, uh, Jacob apologizes for being carried away in his style and so forth. This long thing, I say, wouldn't bore an ancient uh, audience necessarily, but uh, is it a display of, Jace of Jacob's own versatility? For example, a classic subject of disputation in the schools in ancient Babylon, as, as in Greece, but especially the Babylonian, uh, and uh, elsewhere in the schools when the, uh, of rhetoric, was a debate between trees. The olive tree would debate with the vine as to which was superior. So, and this would go on and on and on. They could go on all day. Classic debate being, of course, they never get tired of this stuff. That uh, Galbungus, Terence and Galbungus, are supposed to have, have uh, debated for 14 days and nights on whether ego has a vocative case. Well, if you can do a thing like that, one word has a vocative case. Well, we proceed here. The uh, grafting, on the, uh, grafting on the branches and the like, and the various things you can do with it. And uh, there are other writings like this. I mean, you could compare with it the, for style. Uh, and you ask this question when you look at it here. How does it describe the condition of the world today? This, you'll find that description in here, too. But the, uh, well, I mentioned before those four chapters in John, chapters 14 to 17 in John. He's talking about the relationship of the Father, the Son, the Apostles, and the people to whom the Apostles would preach, and also the world comes in. And he goes over and over and over it again. The, the same thing seems to be repeating. He isn't exactly repeating. For all those four chapters, are just taken up with that. There are hundreds and hundreds of prepositions uh, just uh, tied together by nouns, just a few. And all these prepositions and, uh, and pronouns, of course, it's the pronouns, I and me, me and thee, thee and them, and so forth. This goes on uh, in one chapter, I think there are over 200 of those personal pronouns. So it's the same sort of thing. You'd think John would get tired, get worn out talking like that, but he knows exactly what he's talking about. And it makes it very clear, and he has, to, he has to rub it in, too. But here this goes on, the various things. Now, this thing about the garden, I talked about it prefers the, the rocky land. The karst of, of the Dalmatian coast is called the karst. That's absolutely bare rock. I mean, where the wa soil has been washed away, it was timbered once upon a time, anciently. The timber was cut down, and the soil was all washed away. And that happens when you, when you cut them down, you lose them forever. And, uh, and then the cars, so, but it's all olive orchards. As you go, the, the whole coast of Dalmatia is all these olive orchards. And between the olive trees, olive grows, and between the olive trees are the, the vines growing. But a carom, if you go back to the oldest, uh, the word carom, of course, is a, that's the word for, for olive grove. In its oldest occurrence, when it appears in the book of Judges, 15 and 5, that's an olive grove. But in the rest of the Bible, it means a vineyard. In Exodus 22 and 4, and in Isaiah 22 and 7, Karim, they use the expression sometimes, Karen Chaim. Isaiah used Karen Chaim, which is very interesting, because Chaim isn't the, isn't the Hebrew word for, for uh, grapes or vines. It's the Arabic word for grapes and, and wine. Yayin is the Hebrew word, whence the Greek get oinus, and we get our wine, Latin Venus and wine. See, because wine did come from the, the grapes, did come from the Middle East. Palestine is the home of the vine. And as well as the olive, they go together. And the very, the very famous poems about uh, Ovid and so forth about the, about the uh, olive and the vine, how the vine clings to the olive and grows up around it and so forth. The classic wedding of the olive and the vine is, is a classic theme. But here the, the word actually means either one. It means a vineyard or it means an olive grove, and they grew together. So Karim, when you see it in the Old Testament, you can translate it as either one. And that's exactly what Jacob has done here. Of course, he's not an olive a cultivator. He was born after the family left home. He'd probably never seen a, a grape growing, unless it was wild grapes down in the Karim Mountains there. I doubt that. But uh, he's talking in the terms of the scripture, because he says he's quoting Z in Zenos. He's taking his story from Zenos. It's not in his own experience at all. So this is a very old, and in very old times, I say, before the days of Isaiah, uh, they called it a K Karen Hammer. Uh, and of course, uh, Hammer is uh, hammer is the Arabic word for wine, as, as against Yayan, our word for wine. So it's very old, and wine, uh, garden, orchard, six of one, half a dozen of the other, you can take your choice, and so forth. Then he talks about preserving the roots, about transplanting here. Then he goes on, improvement of the crop in the, 
uh, 17th verse. Uh, the roots assert themselves as they will. They'll catch on, 18th verse. It's marvelous that they can grow in that rocky soil because they are and bring forth tame fruit. And then there's a problem of storage, laid it up against the season unto my own self. Uh, it's like wine, same thing, the rare vintage you keep, and it's, it's particularly good. They'll say up at Sunland, the olives are particularly good this year, and so this is a good year and sometimes a bad one. And it's the same thing with, uh, with wine, as we all know, because of being oinologists, all of us <laughs> show we're experts on wine. Uh, and go to the nethermost part, and then, and then here's the harvest, whither they hid the natural branches of the tree. Uh, the olive, the ancients used to, you, very interesting discourses in this by, by Galen, the, the medicine writer, the doctor. Uh, they would tie rocks, tie rocks from the branches, so they would grow low, so they'd be easy to harvest, is the thing. But they, the classic way is to harvest is to whack the tree with long poles and then catch them in a canvas. And that's the way they did. Uh, but the, uh, they do these tricks and make the tree grow as low as possible so they could reach the f as much fruit as they could. And now, but uh, Galen gave a different explanation, a very amusing one. Now, how comest thou that thou was in the, po no, in the poorest spot? Here was experimental planting. You do that all the time. You have to try out so you never know what's going to happen. He said, experimental planting. I knew it was a poor spot, he said. And another, a spot of ground poorer than the first from that. He not only let it grow there, but he planted an even poorer marginal, but he's determined on expansion. It brought forth much fruit. He wants to expand his enterprise. He was a thing like the, like the, like, like the stock market with the olives. You can play around and do things like that. Another branch also brought forth fruit. You can lose all there and you can gain all. You see. And notice he talks about the hybrids here. A good spot of ground nourished in a long time. Only a part of the tree has brought forth tame fruit. Another part has brought forth wild fruit. Well, that happens to it surprise you, these hybrids that come. And then the pruning is so important. It'll, stay no, it'll stand almost no amount of pruning. Pluck off the branches that have not brought forth the good fruit and throw them into the fire. And then you have to rake up the orchard. Uh, go, behold the servant, let us prune it and so forth. We'll nourish the fruit a long time. The end soon cometh. And then corruption, you see, the tree can be spoiled. And once it's gone, what are you going to do? You try to save it. He says, tries desperately to save it. He's talking about Israel now, you see. The tree was broken and the wild branches grafted in. Behold, all sorts of fruit did cumber the tree. Israel is mixed up with everybody here. And you could, sh I think you could show that. You know, put a sociologist on that. And it had taste of every sort. And there was this bad tree that had no good fruit on it at all. What do you do? The servant says, what do we do? Well, let's try to save it. The servant wanted to save it. And the uh, they transplanted, uh, they uh, grafted in the oleaster, but what happened in the 37th verse, the wild branches overrun the roots, they take completely control of the fruit, and the roots begin to perish. The natural branches become corrupt, and then they all become corrupt, and the poor lord of the vineyard wept, in the because it's a precious olive tree. <laughs> what could I have done more for my vineyard? He keeps calling it a vineyard, because uh, olive grove is two words, and carom, they just use the same word for both. You see, the same one word, vineyard, carom, one. And in English, we prefer one word to using two, I'm sure. Greater economy. And uh, all had become corrupted. All the trees are good for no, boy, it's getting bad in the 42nd verse. All the trees are good for nothing. This is the last day, boy, this is where we are now, you see. Cause for alarm, you see. Who is it that has corrupted the vineyard? He goes into that, the nether, oh, it goes on and on. They began to grow, continue. Well, and the end cometh, the season is an end, my vineyard will I cause to be burned with fire. That's the final end. You can see all the episodes in between, all the things that can happen to Israel. Now, he explains it in the sixth chapter. He says, I'm going to explain it now. He says, this is my prophecy, that the things which the prophet, which the prophet Zeno spake concerning the house of Israel came, must surely come to pass. So he's going to explain what's going to happen to the house of Israel. This was in terms of olive tree, Zenos. This is in terms of Jacob himself. And he begins at the end. Uh, he's going to go backwards and... Uh, and then the rest are flashbacks, you see. But he tells how it's all going to end in the end. It's a common dramatic, uh, common dramatic, especially in movies, they do this thing, you see. You see what the end, what brought this all to pass, and then it goes back and tells you the story, how this came to be. And so, the last time, he's talking about the last time, the world shall be burned with fire. Wow, verse three there. How merciful is our God. He remembers Israel, though, the roots and the branches. But they don't like it. They fight him. They're a stiff-necked, gainsaying people. 
Well, then why, plan, why bring a plan to such people? It's, they, the gospel has no better chance than a snowball in hell in, on the earth. People aren't going to accept it. They didn't in the time of Moses. They didn't in the time of Christ. They don't today. And they gave Joseph a bad time from the first, you see. And, but then, and then John tells us why, why they didn't, of course. As he says right in the beginning, the, uh, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Remember, the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. He came unto his own, and his own received him. But as many as did receive him, he gave power to become sons of God. Now, isn't that worth doing, is he? Just for a few, if it's possible. Power to become sons of God. It's the power again. And so we have here, there are stiff and uh, naked and gainsaying people, but as many as will not harden their hearts. So there's some that won't. And for the sake of them, it's worth it. See, that's what the test is all about, as John tells us. But as many as would hearken, they become sons of God. As well as would not hearken their heart, they shall be saved in the kingdom of God. So the theme is repent, because all are capable and all are culpable, as far as that goes. He cleaves to us. Notice, he's, it's up to us. God is waiting. He's uh, waiting any old time, as far as you're willing to come around. Remember, he cleaves unto you, while his arm of mercy is extended towards you in the light of day, harden not your hearts. But work, he says, for the time cometh when no man can. The day isn't going to be here forever. So it's very urgent. And he uses the expression, don't procrastinate whatever you do. Don't put it off because an awful lot is at stake here. Why would we go, would we make just a few short years depend on a whole stretch of eternity hereafter? And could that thing really be so? I think it really is. There, see, there, there are just a few bugs to get out of our existence here that, to perpetuate our life. The Russians think they can do it and um, make persons practically immortal. They can extend it out. But then you have this, you see. There's no reason to living forever unless you have reason to live forever. And the Lord says, well, come to that later. But, well, no, it's eaten. Nephi explained that to you too, didn't he? Why you would live forever. He says, you get to, you'll cross that bridge when you get to it. The Lord will tell you everything you're going to do hereafter, and you don't worry about it as you go. And when you get there, you know there's plenty to be done. But meantime, he says, meantime, you can't bear the thought of living for a thousand years. It would bore you stiff. And so you have a story like Heinlein's stories about the old ones, you know, those that can't die. They're the miserable old ones. They suffer unspeakable. They're bored. They've seen everything. Omnia fui et nihil expedit. As the Emperor Severus said, I've seen everything. Nothing's worth bothering about. But if you have to go on living, and as we learn here in the Book of Mormon, very definitely, you, they cannot die. You have to go on, whether you like it or not, because that's already been arranged. So I say, in theory, there's no reason why that can't be so. Why we break down, the second law, why you last just to a particular period and then suddenly shut off, uh, as if it was arranged ahead of time. If you can re live, ten, live 10 years, why can't you live 20? If you can live 20, why can't you live 30, and so forth, and so on. And you can go up to your hundreds, and so forth. So, uh, and, we, and we cover quite a stretch of time. As I, as I say, I have personally and intimately been acquainted with people whose lives stretch to more than 250 years apart, see? and I've known them personally. One my grandpa Reed, the other my grandson. The one will be living. 253 years from the time the other was born, if he lived even as long as I do. So there you are. So uh, this isn't it, no. Hardened your hearts. Why will you die? There is, there is a time limit. Notice the second verse, next verse. Today, he, here today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For why will you die? Why will you bring forth evil fruit? There's the vineyard, you see. That ye must be hewn down and cast into the fire. So is the crisis so great? The word crisis means the point of judgment, the point of decision. Why would you be hewn into fire just for being a human being and fiddling around and doing the things that normal human beings do and making a fool of yourself the way we all do and so forth? Why would you be damned like that, hewn down and cast into the fire? Ha! You have to make it. You have to insist on it. You have to insist on it, he said. Notice the eighth verse here. Behold, will you reject these words? Will you reject the words of the prophet? Will you reject all the words which have been spoken concerning Christ? Will you deny the good word of Christ? Will you quench the Holy Spirit, he says? Notice there are steps by which you do it here. First you reject it, that's fine. Then you vocally deny it. Then you quench it, you do everything you can to stamp it out, the Holy Spirit, and then you mock it, you make fun of the whole thing. You mock the great plan of redemption. Well, what do you expect if you do that, you see? You've asked for it here. You mock the great plan of redemption which has been laid for you. Uh, you'll never get home now if, you, if you're not careful, if you miss this time. Know ye not that you do these things, that the power of redemption 
And the resurrection? By that, you'll have to stand the resurrection and stand before the Lord and stand in shame and awful guilt. You are brought back to stand trial. But only that. Oh, then, well. And then this lake of fire, and this is a metaphor. You see the lake of fire and brimstone whose flames are unquenchable, and the brimstone is endless torment. That's what represent, brimstone represents, see? just like the olive tree. You're not a real olive tree. Don't get that idea, you see. Oh, then, my beloved brethren, repent ye and enter at the straight gate and the narrow. There is a proper course to follow, and it's rather an easy one. You have to watch now. Now, there's a character by the name of Charon who challenges this teaching. And so he's included in here because he gave Jacob a bad time, and uh, he didn't want to take any of this. And so this is the argument on the other side. So this is the way people go, most of them. And he began to preach that there should be no Christ. Well, you have no belief in that. I say, I have plenty of friends who not only believe that their Christ will never return, but don't, but they don't believe for a minute that I believe it. They, they can't accept the fact that, that I would be fool enough to believe that. <laughs> I'm definitely sure of it. So they began to preach that there should be no Christ. He did. And he was very flattering unto the people, you see. Uh, he, uh, he gave them what they wanted to hear. God is dead, all is permitted. That's what they wanted to hear. And because they, remember, they were, these people were misbehaving. They were getting too rich, but above all, they were being immoral. And so they didn't want to hear this. And what he told them, but it was flattering to hear, they were no trouble at all. Just go right ahead doing what you're doing, flattering to the people. He, he was permissive, in other words, that he might overthrow the doctrine of Christ. Now, and notice he was a rhetorician. He was a popular orator. He was a spellbinder, and that meant for a lot, you see. He had a perfect knowledge of the language. He knew how to manipulate the language of the people the vernacular, wherefore he could use much flattery and much power of speech, make them feel good, butter them up, as, as uh, Isaiah says, they want to hear smooth things, just talk smooth things to them, and you're elected, you're in there, you see. Much flattery, much power of speech according to the power of the devil, because Joseph Smith says the devil is an orator. He certainly is, well. Then, but he says, uh, his answer was that I'm seeing what I've seen. I've seen angels and ministered unto me. Well, Sharon, I haven't seen them. So he becomes very indulgent. Now remember, this Sherem is being very orthodox. He thinks he's the religious one. He thinks he's pious. He accuses, notice this is typical uh, of the way you attack, uh, you defend yourself by an attack. And he says, Sherem is the one who's leading the, uh, he says, Jacob's leading the people astray. He's teaching false doctrine. If there ever was a waste of time, it was that. Talking to a philosopher. <laughs> Reminds me of the, at, no, at the Council of Nicaea, at the Council of Nicaea, uh, before they had the main session in 325, uh, Constantine had called the council, and Eusebius, who was there, he was there in person, he was a friend of the emperor, he was there. And they were discussing things, seating problems and all this sort of protocol and stuff, and they started debating issues, and finally an, uh, a rustic farmer, somebody up in the gallery who'd been attending, he got up and says he, he didn't know whether it was the greatest miracle to make a stone speak or to make a philosopher shut up, <laughs> which is the greatest miracle. <laughs> but anyway, he was this kind, and he was powerful. He says he was all right. And so he comes up to him, Brother Jacob, he speaks to him very benevolently, you see. I have sought much opportunity that I've seen. I've been wanting to speak to you for a long time, you see. He's posing as the zealous champion of truth. You go about preaching that which you call the gospel or doctrine of Christ. Oh, no, he says. You've led away much of this people and perverted the right way of God. And you don't keep the law of Moses, which is the right way. See, he's teaching the orthodox way. He's, he's doing what's right, you see. He's Sherem. He's the defender of the faith of orthodoxy. Uh, and notice it's not a case of believer versus non-believer or atheist versus uh, theist or something like that. No, no. Uh, this is our simplistic view of the things. We always think of the Book of Mormon as these conflicts between the good guys and the bad guys, the people that believed and the people that didn't know. He, he, wasn't, a, he wasn't an atheist at all, you see. We keep the law of Moses, which is the right way. And what you're teaching, he says, I declare to you that this is blasphemy, what you're teaching. What does the word blasphemy mean? What does it come for? What is blasphemia? To speak blapto. Blapto is what? It's to treat lightly, to treat not with contempt, but to treat uh, not seriously. Not to take, it is not to damn something to hell. It is not to say horrible and tremendous things, but to treat, treat lightly. It's much worse to treat the gospel as a trivia and laugh it off. See, you can't reach people like that. Much worse than it is to attack it savagely and say, I'll show you where it's wrong, and really do some studying, because then you're in danger, you see. But uh, 
And that's what blasphemy is. And we get the impression, you see, that when a person speaks blasphemy, oh, he's done, he's spoken terrible things, he's denounced, he's, uh, he's used vile language, not a bit of it. Blasphemy is treating it like, uh, this is nothing, we'll, we'll laugh it off. Blasphemy is laughing something off, you see, which is the best argument. If you want to crush something that you can't answer, you just laugh it off. You walk out of the room, you see. They ask, ask plenty of, of questions uh, about the gospel and so forth, but they never wait for answers. I've noticed I have a lot of talks with some of those people. But uh, keep not the law of Moses, which is the right way. He's that. Now he says, this is blasphemy, because no man knoweth these things to come. That's true, you can't know for yourself. And behold, the Lord God poured his spirit into my soul. That's an interesting expression. Is this a circumlocution for inspiration? He uses these eloquent expressions. He poured his spirit. No, it, uh, what the impression you get, you see, is a sudden idea, a sudden inspiration. He sudden came to him like that. We'd put, express it differently, mind me. While I was talking with Sharon, he says, he poured his spirit into my soul and knew exactly what I was to say. It was not himself speaking. And insomuch that I confounded him. I was able to stop him cold. That was it. Oh, he said, no, well, it, and so he doesn't tell us the debate that took place in which he confounded him. Disputatio, you see, all the schools are founded on disputatio, the disputation. That's what you do. That's how you train rhetoricians. We have mock courts here to train lawyers and so forth, uh, and rhetoric is a vile profession, uh, as Socrates explains to his friend Gorgias, who was the greatest rhetoric of his time. You know, our word Gorgias comes from his name because of the style of rhetoric he introduced. Gorgias. His name was Gorgias, and he came from... He came from Sicily and was a very good friend when he opened a, a school and his friend, he and his friend Patagas, was the first person to make a million dollars uh, teaching law and uh, rhetoric, how to win cases and sway, and sway um, legislatures and so forth. But anyway, that's what he was. Now, so notice he's already backtracked in the, in the ninth verse. Cherem is backtracked. He says, well, if there should be a Christ, I wouldn't deny him. That's all right. I'd, I'd accept him. But I know there is no Christ, neither has been or ever will be. I said, well, what about the scriptures? They truly testify of Christ. The atonement is the subject of the Old Testament. I've, since I've done this thing on atonement, which I'm supposed to finish up today, a lot of footnotes, that's come home to me so strongly that the whole thing is atonement. The whole thing is the mission of the Messiah. That's what the whole Old Testament's about. And of course, the Jews won't accept that. But uh, they truly testify of Christ. And it's made manifest by the power of the Holy Ghost that should there be no atonement made, all mankind must be lost because the atonement, the sacrifice of Isaac was not the complete. Isaac actually wasn't sacrificed. They say that's the atoning sacrifice. So then, it, but notice he gets a bit sarcastic here. He falls back on the thing you're, you're sure he's going to fall back on. Show me a sign. Give me a sign or a symbol. Show me a sign by the power of the Holy Ghost in which you know so much. You say, you know so much about this Holy Ghost. You, say, you just try to tell me who the Holy Ghost is. Says. Show me a sign. And it's the thirteenth verse, by this this power of the Holy Ghost in which you know so much. And it's very cynical, very sarcastic. And that go to him on, he says, Well, I don't want to tempt God to show a sign unto you. Nevertheless, is not my will be done, but if God shall smite thee, let that be a sign unto thee. Well, the guy has a severe stroke then on the stage. He's overwrought anyway. He's been losing the argument. I think he's all excited and ready to bust a blood vessel. And so he fell, he collapses completely, falls down, and he has to be nourished for many days. He had a bad stroke and passed out completely. A severe shock, a severe stroke rather. Uh, he was the high pressure type, type A like me, that gets those things. <laughs> and uh, have to watch all the time, you see. And uh, then he, when he came to himself, he asked the, the people to be gathered together. Uh, for I shall die. It's clear, you see, because he was still claiming to be orthodox. He was still accepting the Bible. And so he's still available. And, and this, this brings him to repentance. He sees he's been wrong now. He spake plainly unto them. He denied the things which he had taught them. He did it out of vanity. You could see this. This happens all the time to the church. And as, as Faust says, it's Zaurum Schweiss to Sagenweich for such advice and this sort of thing. Uh, well, he says a lot of speeches on that. His hypocrisy worries him very much, you see. It makes him sick. Well, I denied Christ, and I said that I believed the Scriptures. That's true. The scriptures. Remember, Christ here is the, the Greek equivalent, the, one we, the Christian equivalent of 
Messiah. It's always Messiah, of course, the, the Messiah, it means the anointed. Creo is the Greek word for anoint, and Christos is one who's been anointed, the anointed one. And uh, Messiah is the Messiah, Messiah is the one who has been anointed. And the uh, and Jesus is the Savior, Yehoshuach. Jesus means the Savior, the anointed, Jesus Christ. And uh, I have thus lied, he says. And then he gave up the ghost. It came to pass when he said these words, he gave up the ghost. And the multitude, need to say, were impressed. They were overpowered and fell to earth. You notice in the Book of Mormon, they're falling to earth quite a bit when you're overpowered. This spontaneous falling to earth. Now, they're formal and traditional responses to certain stress, and they differ very greatly. For example, in a German classroom, if you like what a teacher says, everybody starts stamping on the wooden floor, just like that, till the, till the whole building shakes. If you like it, that's perfectly all right, that's accepted. And if you don't like what he says, because that's only fair, you hiss till you raise the ceiling, you see. That's all right, you can do that. They're, very, they're mo much more outspoken, much less restrained than we are, because with an anglo saxon stiff upper lip. We never indulge in things like that. Above all, we don't collapse and fall down, but that's a common oriental gesture. That's the way you salute. That's the way you recognize things. And of course, that is five times a day. You put your little rug on the ground and you fall down on your face. And this is, this is called proskinesis. It means falling right down and kissing the ground. The proskinesis is a very common, uh, is a very common uh, way of demonstration in the ancient world. Prosc when the emperor came, it was a proskinesis. When the pope passes, the everybody falls down flat. <laughs> You're supposed to be overpowered. This is the idea. The same way you're supposed to blind yourself like this with a Roman suit. The dazzling light of the king is so great, you put your hand in front of you to protect your eyes. It, that's your, that's your proskinesis and your salute. And so the, uh, the same thing. And of course, by the miracle, uh, Sherem had tipped the scales here. These people, remember, they had attended. They had attended the disputation here. And it was going both ways. And of course, Sherem lost it. And when... Jacob won hands down, it made a big impression. They, they were ready to, they were ready for, to be impressed now. And then when Sherem himself came and admitted it and confessed it, then when he died, they, the multitude immediately went down in the proskinesis and recognized this, this spontaneous gesture, which I say is very, very common in the Orient. Uh, it happens, yes, where, since when have thy knees forgot their, uh, their duty and so forth, it's very, if you don't do that, of course, you're, uh, you're in real trouble if you, in, in the presence of the emperor or someone like that. The, uh, remember in Richard II, uh, where, where he says, uh, thy, thy lawful joints. Oh, he has something to say about that anyway. Well, and it came to pass, the peace and love of God was restored. So he ends on a happy note, on an upbeat here. But they tried to restore the Lamanites, and this was hopeless. Uh, he says, they couldn't move them. It was vain, every effort we made. They delighted in wars and bloodshed, an eternal hatred against us, their brethren. They sought to destroy us continually. Now these, these blood feuds, and, and it ends in this, in this down, you start, it was gonna end up beat, but it ends on a very sad note in an extremely eloquent passage. I think there's nothing in the Book of Mormon more moving than this. It sounds like a, uh, like a dirge. It sounds like a solemn dirge, the way, the way the prose is here. I, Jacob, began to be old, and the record of the people being kept on other plates of Nephi, wherever, wherefore I conclude this record, declaring, I have written according to the best of my knowledge, by saying, and this is it, the time passed away with us, and also our lives passed away, like as it were unto us a dream, we being a lonesome and a solemn people, wanderers cast out from Jerusalem, born in tribulation, in a wilderness, and hated of our brethren, which caused wars and contentions, wherefore we did mourn out our days. The spondies, I mean, the more we did mourn out our day. It reminds me of more of the border ballads of Scotland than anything else, like uh, Edward and uh, Clark Saunders and uh, the Percy and the Douglas and so forth. They're very sad. And uh, I love he built me a bonny boor. And uh, there are many, the, the, bar, uh, the uh, Percy's reliques and the, uh, the border ballads of Scotland are, are very sad. There came the king by middle night and saw his the men, some men by middle night and and, uh, uh, and by middle day who saw their their sport and went their way and brought the king that very night who brought my beer and slew my knight and these terrible stories they tell of the border wars because there's all these perpetual feuds so this situation in which people so well look at Ireland today my my grandmother left they moved over from Edinburgh to to Ulster but. Uh, 
he was the first branch president in Ireland, and my great grandfather, the one I remember, who was 20 years old when Joseph Smith died. But uh, my grandmother left Ireland when she was 17, and she said she never wanted to go back. This is way back in those days. She says all she could remember in Belfast was blood running down the gutter. She said she could just see that blood in the gutter. So, so these feuds go on forever and ever, and this is one of those perennial feuds that you have in, in the Book of Mormon. And of course you get it in the old world all the time. Well, look what you're having in Lebanon today. Now, is there ever, ever going to be any settlement? This is the same feeling of blood and hatred and despair and mourning out our days that you find in, uh, in the Book of Mormon. And it's, it's Oriental, I'm saying it's Near Eastern. This is Palestine today. Sad, the Jews and the Arabs having a terrible time. So, now we come to the Book of Enos. This is a fascinating book because uh, the, it's a portrait study, a very good portrait study. And it came, uh, then, behold, it came to pass, I, Enos. Now, he is the, notice, he says, I gave the plates to his son Enos. Now, Enos received the plates as his successor to the highest religious office in the state. He was the grandson of Lehi. See, so it's, he was a blue blood here. He would have been the king, but remember, Nephi's people uh, anointed his brothers to be high, the high priests, and the king, the kings were apparently minor figures, uh, as you find them very often in history. Uh, the king is not the important person at all, and uh, Lehi, uh, Enos would be king presumptive as far as that goes, but they're just named second, third, fourth, fifth Nephi. You never read about them here, but this isn't the historical part anyway. But still, he was a person of great importance as far as that goes, and who would be the next high priest. In the, this religious community, the Kims are not the real leaders. Uh, the kings are often ghost kings. Well, like the queen, she opened parliament this week and she read a speech to parliament, which was her policy for the coming, for the coming year in parliament. And uh, she didn't know what the speech said until she read it in parliament. She didn't write it at all. It was written for her by parliament. And uh, then she just read the speech as if she was giving the orders of the whole thing. Now he's out hunting. The best way to keep a, a pretender to the throne or, or an aspiring prince from getting into trouble and trying to jump the gun, of course, is to Wait a minute, I brought something on about that, I think. Uh, is to uh, send him hunting. Oh, where have you been, Lord Randall, my son? Oh, where have you been, my handsome young man? I've been to the Wildwood, Mother, make my bed soon. For I think I've been poisoned and fain would lie doon. You see, they are always trying to get rid of him, so they send him out hunting so I'll be safe. But it's not to be safe when you go out hunting. Remember what happened to William II? The son of uh, the son of uh, uh, Henry the first, uh, uh, William the first, William the Conqueror. Well, he was redheaded, and he went out hunting in the forest one day. And a fellow called Turrell, he was shot. Uh, it was a political thing, and he was killed. Uh, he said it was a sure. He th said he took Henry's uh, William's, excuse me, William the second, William's redhead for a squirrel. Well, maybe he did. You see, but it's not safe for princes to hunt alone. Enos is hunting alone here, and. Uh, what happened to Siegfried? Siegfried was the successor. Siegfried was the prince. But remember who came up and stabbed him in the back while they were hunting? He was hunting and he was hunting alone. And then uh, Zagunta comes up behind him and uh, puts a spear in his back and that was the end of Siegfried. And so kings shouldn't hunt alone. And uh, there's a recent history of Persia by Rasvanjani, another Rasvanjani, who accounts that no less than 67 shahs of Persia, princes, shahs of Persia, were murdered on the hunt. See, because you can have all sorts of accidents on the hunt, you see. How convenient to get rid of him. There was hardly a single shot in all the history of Persia over a thousand years that uh, succeeded, uh, the, the, the succeeded the person before him legitimately as a son or anything else. There was always somebody else. There was war between every Shah fought the next Shah <laughs> like that and was plotted against so less. He says no less than 67 Shahs of Persia were killed on the hunt. So here is Prince going on the hunt and he is wrestling before God. Now, when you're out hunting alone, uh, he tells us he's not having much fun here, and he, uh, he comes out to think about things, and he does. That's the situation in which you can do it. Remember another person who went out hunting and was thinking about things in the woods? He went to the woods. He retreated to the woods then, and then he left his wife. He'd just been married a year, left his wife and baby and went out, and that was Gautama Buddha. That was the Buddha, Siddhartha, he was a member of a princely family, uh, a Rajan. The Rajan were minor, not minor princes, but, but kinglets, uh, like, uh, like Enos and like Jacob. Jacob himself was, 
was, was not virtual ruler, but he has, had considerable clout in the state. And that's what Buddha's father was. He had that, he had that influence too. But Buddha start, started thinking about the worthlessness of it all. Well, his father didn't want him <coughs> to get religion, so he surrounded him with all sorts of luxuries and things to distract his attention. Uh, the beautiful the damsels and all that, with everything you can imagine, and that spoiled him even more. He saw the worthlessness of all. It wasn't getting anywhere. It just gnawed him. And so it's the worthlessness of the world. And he emerges with a totally different, with a totally different, the absolute diametrical opposite of, of our friend Enos. The same situation. He was born probably in the same year that Enos. He was born in 563. If you figure out that to be just about the time that Enos was born, they're the same age. You see, <coughs> Enos and the Buddha. Remember how to spare it with the two D's and the H, would there? Uh, and he's Gautama. That's his family name, you see. Gautama, his name. Gautama Siddhartha, the prince. Uh, the, the Buddha, of course, the enlightened one. That's the name he gets. So he goes, see, the Buddha goes and uh, retreats from the world and uh, sits under the pipal tree and re has his revelations and so forth and founded the religion which had more members than any other, but it's a philosophy, it's not, not a religion really. The two basic principles are, the first is there is no I, there is no ego, you're, you're going to be involved into nirvana. Don't get any, no, see he goes the opposite, see, he had all this luxury, all, he had everything, and it, what does it mean? Nothing, you see, and it, it obsessed him. So what are we? We are nothing. Just forget that. Forget any projects, forget any ifs, and be absorbed in it. And that's just the opposite, of course, of Enos, where it is the individual who's going to live eternally. As far as this goes, he's going to be exalted, go on. The other is just be absorbed. And the, the philosophy is, of course, uh, don't expect anything and you won't be disappointed. But don't expect anything. And the other is that the, the, five, the five senses that, that betray us and don't show us reality at all. We don't see reality, and we're not going anywhere, and you are not you, after all. And it, it's denial, the whole thing. And on that is based on philosophy of life, and control, self-control, and behavior, and so forth. But, uh, but he, notice, he had been taught in his language and admonition, so he is a very thoughtful young man, and he really has a conscience, and his uselessness of his life is worrying him sick. Now he says, I'll tell you of the wrestle which I had before God. Notice it wasn't like Jacob wrestling with the angel, with God. It says he wrestled with God, not the angel. It's translated the angel in, in our Bible. That's not correct, though. Uh, I will tell you of the wrestle which I had before God as I received remission. Now, when you wrestle, you see, before God, that means you try to... What does a wrestler do when he starts to... He tries to strike position, have to take up a position take up a stance, decide your approach, and so forth. If you've been living in the world, and in, in the world of daily life, and been uh, uh, completely preoccupied with trivial things, uh, for to be carnally minded is death. That comes strongly to me all the time. Carnally minded is anything concerned to what's of this world, is death. Well, if you think about that, then if you're going to approach God, you can't do it just cold like that. You just can't get in and say, hey, God, listen to me. I have something to say. Notice, you're facing the most high here, and you can't put anything over on him. He can see right through you, so you better be careful what you say. It's going to be your great advantage, you see, to see through yourself and everything else, because he's going to see through you. So you wrestle with it. You, you have a struggle to tear yourself loose from your, your preoccupations and your thoughts and your petty ideas, and to keep concentrated during prayer takes some effort. That's why the ancient Christian prayer circle, you see, when you, you concentrate your mind just in a burning glass on a particular object, and it has to be take great concentration. It's not easy. With him, it's a wrestle. He comes out here, and he's not content with his life at all. He feels he's not doing, he's not living up to his capacity or anything else. Well, a prince having a good time, wasting his time. He's, he's hunting now, uh, probably hunts too much. He says, this is getting me nowhere. And uh, notice, and this, he makes it very clear here. He went to hunt beasts in the forest, and then the words I had often heard my father say, they keep going through his head concerning eternal life and the joy of the saints. They sunk deep in his heart. He couldn't get them out of it. And he's, Hunting, schmunting, he wouldn't know anything to do with that. Riding along thinking of these things, or walking, as the case may be. And my soul hungered. He was, he really needed something. Oh, I see the time is up now. So we'll, we'll leave hungry then. In that case, I won't do us any harm. We have four more meetings, and we may be able to get as far, say, as the middle of Mosiah. Mosiah is an extremely important book. That is absolutely tops. Takes a different tone entirely from these others.